Just a forewarning, this video is going to be a little bit more technical than my previous Kalam videos. In my last video, I went over some objections to the Kalam cosmological argument and showed that they don't really hold up when placed under scrutiny. And in this video, I'll be going over some more objections to the Kalam argument, but this time focused specifically on the fallacy of equivocation. If you're unfamiliar with it, the fallacy of equivocation is a logical fallacy in which the same word or phrase is used multiple times to mean different things, but the argument treats the word as if it's meaning the same thing all throughout the argument. Probably the most common example of this fallacy is the following argument. Premise 1. Socrates was Greek. Premise 2. Greek is a language. Conclusion, Socrates is a language. The same word Greek is used to mean two different things, but the argument is put forward as if the two uses of the word Greek mean the same thing. Now to defeat the claim of equivocation, all that you need to do is show that the argument uses one singular definition for the word or phrase in question all throughout the argument. Many people claim the Kalam commits the fallacy of equivocation in not just one way, but in four different ways. I'm gonna try and show that these claims fail when placed under scrutiny. And don't worry, I'll have the important information in text on the screen, so if I go too fast, you can just pause the video. Objection 1. In premise 2, the word universe is defined as all matter, space, and time, but in the conclusion, the word universe is defined as everything that exists, has existed, and will ever exist. This is probably the worst of the four equivocation claims, which is why I'm getting it out of the way first. I actually don't know how someone could come up with this claim. The word universe in the Kalam refers to space-time and all its contents, or to put it perhaps more simply, all of physical reality. Even a multiverse, if it existed, would be included in this definition of universe. But nowhere is the word universe taken to mean absolutely everything that is, was, and ever will be. It seems like such a claim just comes out of absolutely nowhere. So maybe some things really can come into being out of nothing. In fact, if that was how the word universe was defined in the Kalam, then the Kalam would be self-contradictory. How could something be the cause of absolutely everything? That thing is itself something that exists, and so if it created absolutely everything, it would have to be the cause of itself, which is absurd. So to recap, the word universe in the Kalam always refers to space-time and its contents all throughout the argument. Objection 2. In premise one, the word cause is defined as material cause, but in the conclusion, the word cause refers to something other than a material cause, as it's impossible for the universe to have had a material cause. To show why this objection fails, we have to be familiar with the difference between a material cause and a so-called efficient cause. Aristotle separated causes into four different categories, although only two categories are relevant to this claim, material and efficient. A material cause is the stuff out of which something is made, the material from which it comes. So for example, the block of marble is the material cause out of which a marble statue is created. Similarly, the material cause of a painting is the paint and canvas. On the other hand, an efficient cause is the thing which brings its effect into being. It's the primary source of its effect. For example, the marble statue's efficient cause is the sculptor, and the painting's efficient cause is the painter, or the artist. So then, how is the word cause defined in the Kalam? Well, it's the second definition, efficient cause, which is used in the Kalam. The argument can be restated as whatever begins to exist has an efficient cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has an efficient cause. 
So to recap, the word cause in the Kalam argument always refers to an efficient cause. Objection 3. In premise 1, the phrase begins to exist means begins from a rearrangement of pre-existing material. But in premise 2, begins to exist means begins from no pre-existing material. As you can probably see, this claim is extremely similar to the last claim, although it is technically different, because rather than claiming that the argument equivocates on the word cause, it claims that the argument equivocates on the phrase begins to exist. This is going to get a bit technical, so bear with me here. Remember that all you need to do to defeat the claim that an argument commits the fallacy of equivocation is to show that the phrase in question is defined the same way all throughout the argument. So all we need to do is have one unified definition for begins to exist. And here I'm going to quote directly from William Lane Craig because I think he gives the most concise, albeit technical, definition of begins to exist. According to Craig, something x begins to exist at some time t if and only if 1. x exists at t 2. there's no time before t at which x exists and 3. there is no state of affairs in the actual world in which x exists timelessly. Now in case you're a bit confused, I'll go over each part of this definition. First, x exists at t. This seems pretty obvious. It would be nonsensical to say that something came into existence at a time when it did not exist. That doesn't make any sense. Second, there is no time before t at which x exists. This also seems pretty obvious. If something comes into being at a certain time, that implies that it did not exist at any time before the time when it came into being. Third, there is no state of affairs in the actual world in which X exists timelessly. Now this one's a bit confusing, but it makes sense if you really think about it. Imagine if you can, a being which exists timelessly without the universe, but enters into time at the moment when the universe is created. In that situation, the being would exist at the first moment of time, and as such there would be no time prior at which that being existed, but it would be nonsensical to say that that being came into existence at the first moment of time. So to recap, the phrase begins to exist is always defined as I quoted previously all throughout the argument. Objection 4. In premise 1, the phrase begins to exist means begins to exist a finite time ago after a point when it did not exist. But in premise 2, begins to exist means begins to exist a finite time ago but which exists at every point in time. Once again, we have a claim that the phrase begins to exist commits the fallacy of equivocation. Now, I could refute this by restating the singular definition of begins to exist that I stated in the last objection, so why am I bringing this claim up? Well, it's because I'm starting to see a trend with some of these equivocation claims. It seems like all people are really doing is just pointing out that two things which supposedly both began to exist are different than each other in some ways. Obviously, there are differences between the universe coming into being and many of the things we see around us coming into being, as these claims of equivocation point out. While many of the things we see beginning to exist have material causes and had some prior time at which those things didn't exist, the universe would not have had any material cause, and there would not have been a prior time at which the universe did not exist. But that doesn't show that the argument commits the fallacy of equivocation. All these different things fall under the category of having begun to exist as defined by the argument. 
The argument uses one unified definition of begins to exist, and that means that the claim of equivocation completely falls apart. So that is all for this video. I hope to show that the Kalam does not equivocate on the words universe, cause, or the phrase begins to exist. But of course, I'm not perfect. If you think I made a mistake in my reasoning, then without a doubt, leave a comment or some kind of video response. Thank you very much for watching. If you liked the video, be sure to share it with your friends and subscribe for more. And if you feel like you have something to say, leave it in the comments. In my next video on arguments for and against the existence of God, I'll be moving on from the Kalam cosmological argument and moving towards the Leibnizian cosmological argument. So stay tuned for that video and I'll see you then.